I love Halloween. I don't know why I said it like that. Hallow it's mostly because of the fall weather, but the candy sales after the holiday, scary stories, and Fortnite costumes are a close second. However, a tradition that I've always been faithful to has once again come around. Playing horror games. I haven't played too many this year, but there is one game that I haven't played yet that I made time to tackle this time around. Outlast. Now I played Outlast too, but never the first game, and I have to say after all the other horror games I've played, and I've played a lot, Outlast is without question the best. Even though I've watched people play this game numerous times, I still found myself tense and frightened around most corners. I also kissed a lot of strangers. Wow. This game came out before COVID, it's alright. Outlast pulls no punches. Everything from disgusting sexual imagery to gore to outright insane characters, all the religious hoobla, this game has it all when it comes to what makes a great horror game. And that's why this video exists. I'm going to explain why I think Outlast is the best horror game out there, and by all means, if you disagree, I would love to hear your expertise on the subject. So, without further ado, my name is Josh, and I hope you enjoy. This game right off the bat tells you, hey, you can't fight, just like in real life. Your only choices are to run, hide, or die. The hidden fourth option being the scream, which I did a lot of that, but I do want to talk about this for a second. One of the greatest things a horror game can do is put you in a situation where you feel hopeless. I mean, how hopeless can you be if you have the 14th Amendment under your belt at all times? Resident Evil 8 is an extreme example because the developers said they wanted to focus more on the combat, but if you ask anybody out there who has played both Resident Evil 7 and 8, Everyone would agree that 7 is scarier, one of the reasons being your weapons are more scarce, you can't fight as often as you would like to. Horror games that have a combat system are not bad in the slightest, and like, if anything, those moments where you can't fight back are intensified, such as the Beneviento household in Resident Evil Village. However, imagine a game where you are hopeless the entire time, and that's Outlast. All you have is a camera to your name, which brings me to another mechanic that I adore. Your only source of vision within the darkest parts of the asylum is the camera's night vision. And this is such a clever idea because not only is this unique to the normal source of light in other games like a flashlight or a lantern, but it does enhance the tension beyond what the gameplay already provides. I was scrambling around the floor searching everywhere for AA batteries because the last thing I wanted was to be left with no light and also uh, being the groom's bride, but we'll get to that later. In addition to that, there are certain jump scares that only happen within the game once you turn on the night vision on your camera. So clearly there was more room for horror than one may think, simply by adding this camera as one of the main functions for the game. Now, let's actually start the game. You are Miles Upshur, a famous YouTube vlogger down to get some crazy footage for the views. I'm just kidding, you're actually a daring journalist who arrives at Mount Massive Asylum and not even five minutes in, you find a dead body hanging from the ceiling and your first jump scare. Now I'm not qualified to explain the story in full, I suck at doing that type of stuff, but the point I want to make here is that the game feeds you enough appetizers to keep you engaged with the story and its setting. Something feels off once you enter the asylum, it's dark, vacant, there's blood everywhere, and there's also a giant man with no nose or lips that throws you off a ledge. You have no idea who or what did all this, and yet there's enough information to speculate and continue forward. Now, not every horror game needs a great story, but it does add so much to the setting, the lore, and honestly, if it's done right, even the horror itself. Behind this facade of an insane asylum, the Murkoff Corporation are conducting experiments on patients to create a host for the Wall Rider. That's pretty messed up, and once you find the details of their operation through confidential files or environmental storytelling, you can't help but feel at least a bit disgusted. I mean, if you just take a good look at the inmates, their faces are all messed up. Most of them have become violent serial killers due to the experiments. And worst of all, this guy is itchy. That's just madness. Now, I've seen many disgusting monsters in video games. I just made a video about that when it comes to the Soul series, but I think the scariest games are those that come as close to the real world as possible. Experimentation on the unwilling sick patients is horrifying to say the least, which has been done in the past, but to see the results of that within the game is even worse. Anyways, let's continue my journey in Outlast. Your second objective in the game is to simply get out of the asylum, which I find to be hilarious. 
not even 20 minutes in, and you're already trying to escape. You explore the rooms of the patients and pass by this dude on a wheelchair grabbing a key card to the security room, and on the way back, that's when the guy jumps at you, and I'll take this moment to address that Outlast has some tasteful jump scares. Now it does fall into the cliche of loud noises and sporadic movements from time to time, but it never solely relies on that. Sometimes you'll find a crazy inmate running at you from the kitchen, other times you'll have subtle jump scares, like this guy peeking over while you crawl through. And the greatest thing is, Outlast never did the same jump scare twice. It's always something different and unexpected. And that's one of the things I appreciate about this game the most. This doesn't even mention the jump scares that can happen while being chased, and that in itself is a different section to talk about, but let's continue my journey. I found this dude in the bathroom, he's not really feeling well, so I let him be. And once I had access to the security room, Father Martin turned off the electricity, which means I have to do what I have to do in every horror game, turning on the generator. Seriously, I think like 95% of horror games have some sort of power and convenience that you must repair. And with the amount of horror games I've played, I think I'm qualified to be an electrician at this point. However, the job description did not include sedation by a priest. I could make a joke about that. A really good one, too. But I'm gonna leave it be. <laughs> he basically shows me the wall rider killing the guards, and he's like, That's pretty cool, huh? Before shoving me in a jail cell where other inmates reside. Some of the locals here are a bit, uh... Unhinged. We have Theodore dancing out the door, Johnny touching himself, and Mark down below smacking his head against the wall. He's been on Twitter too much, but I think the most twisted of the bunch are the twins. Which I can't really show too much footage of. For one, you know, they're naked. And I couldn't help but film... <laughs> I couldn't help but film... <laughs> I couldn't resist. I had, to, I had to film their sausages for evidence of how screwed up this place is. I don't know what it is, but seeing these two dudes naked as the day they were born is just unnerving. In an interview with the developers, they were asked why, they, why make the twins naked. And they responded simply by saying... We wanted to do something that other games don't. Massive credit to them, because it works. Most games haven't done it, and I hate the nudity. After some more small jump scares, we are tasked with a new objective, follow the blood, which, I mean, sounds good to me. Throughout the sequence of following said blood, you'll be tackling quite a few obstacles. One of the main ones being the chase scenes. Uh, the, the chase scenes are the heart of what makes Outlast terrifying from a mechanical standpoint. As you try to escape, whether it may be grabbing a key or turning on some devices, there is an enemy stalking the grounds of interest, making sure that you check around every corner. Now, tension is one of the best tools a horror game can use, and Outlast abuses this tool in the best ways possible. The chase scenes are rarely scripted, meaning they're different each time. The antagonist spawns in the same place, yes, but how you play determines how they play the game too. Now, if you're like me, sometimes I would get caught in their line of sight on purpose, just so I can get it over with. I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I've had my experience with Outlast 2 exploiting the AI. I even caught Chris Walker standing behind a small barricade, just absolutely astounded by my performance. The chases are always intense because navigating the dark somehow becomes more difficult when you have a psychopath chasing you that either wants to eat your balls or make you a woman. And again, the fact that we can't fight back at all makes the tension all the more prominent. Due to the jump scares and chase segments that come without warning, the player is always uneasy, like you're never safe. Which, I mean, you really aren't, but my point is, tension is throughout the whole game, and it never feels stale or repetitive to me. I mean, I enjoy the tension, even if it made me paranoid. That's what makes the game fun. It's crucial to note, by the way, that this game isn't that long either. Like, I beat it in what? Five hours? Not even. But the game doesn't overstay its welcome, and that's appreciated. If Outlast was like 20 plus hours off, then it would feel repetitive and boring. But thankfully it's not. With that out of the way, let's continue. After following the blood religiously, I was now stuck in the sewers with Piggy Boy, where I had to drain the water in order to reach the next section of the asylum. That's where I met Dr. Traeger. This guy is one of my favorites. I appreciate his charismatic attitude towards biology. Except that his biology is performed on patients, killing and torturing them, and he does it solely for money. Oh yeah, did I mention he cut my fingers off too? I mean, at least he washed his hands first. I mean, sanitation is necessary. Uh, I don't think that's sanitary. <laughs> Taking a step back at the bigger picture here, Dr. Traeger is a breath of fresh air. He's the only person in the entire game, DLC included, where he's not incredibly stern or serious. He has his own flair of insanity presented by his light-hearted charm towards, well, torturing people, 
and this was needed to break the constant tone of seriousness. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is a very serious situation, he's trying to kill us. But his difference of tone really helped add a variety to the characters. Too bad he was short-lived because he got caught in the elevator trying to stab us. It's not my fault, he should have followed the basic rules of safety. Everyone knows this. Of course, the first thing I did was film his corpse for everyone to see because now, for me, high fives are no longer uh, available. After Dr. Traeger's death, I went where no gamer has gone. The outside, where we have our first hand signs of the Wall Rider's existence. Soon after, I saw Papa Martin and I made an oopsie dropping our camera in the crevice of the bottom floor. What follows is a great mini segment of trying to navigate the dark without the camera. It really goes to show you how much you rely on that camera to see, and if you haven't played before, you're wondering if you're ever going to get that camera back. I found it though, but unfortunately the camera has a little scratch in it now, and there's also guys trying to kill me, but I mean, what else is new, besides the scratch on the camera? It's here in the theater that we now get some backstory about the Wall Rider and Dr. Wernicke, the man who started all of this. As you can see, we don't really have a lively crowd here, but, I mean, at least we have some sort of participation going on. But this is great. I don't mind if a game like this would entirely base its story on the environment, but it's nice to get some direct information straight from the game. It's at this point we have seen everything Father Martin wanted us to see, so before we leave, Martin Boy asks us to film his death by burning on the cross. And this is one of my favorite scenes in the entire game. It's a nice wrap-up to the whole insane adventure we've been on. At this point, I don't think I need to explain much. I'm pretty sure you understand why this is not normal. This is gonna make a great YouTube video. And at this point, I realized how isolated we truly are in this game. The only friend, I put quotation marks in my script there, the only friend we've made in the entire game is Father Martin. Even in Outlast 2, your goal was to save your wife, a companion, hello, you came to the mountains with your wife, and you even have flashbacks of a childhood lover, or whoever she was, I don't remember, but it gives you a break from the action, from the horror. In Outlast 1, you don't even have memories to fall back on, to take you away from the asylum for at least a moment. You are completely alone the entire time, and it feels like everyone else is against you. And this is something that many horror games don't really do much anymore. Some of my favorite ones have complete isolation, like Outlast, like Cry of Fear. There are no companions to help comfort you or break the constant fear. It's the only thing you know. And what we know is that Father Martin for once did something and fixed the elevator for us. You know what, I was wrong about you, buddy. Thanks so much for fixing the elevator. You know, I'll, I'll forgive you for sedating me earlier on. There's the exit, and potentially the end of this video. Yeah, it's not that easy. This is the final part of the game where you discover the hidden operation under the disguise of a correctional facility. To sum up what Mouth Breather is saying over here, the Wall Rider is loose and he wants you to kill him by unplugging his life support. Oh yeah, that's also Dr. Wernicke. This operation started like a hundred years ago, so he's supposed to be dead. It's a great twist, but the way I explained it doesn't make it look like it, but it was. So yeah, we're off to kill Billy, the piggy boy stops us. Or at least try to. We kill Billy, get a sh get a get shot a bunch, and become the new host for the Wall Rider. It's a great ending, but that's not where my journey ends. Whistle Blower. This is the DLC, and I'm not gonna walk you through the entire thing, but there are some aspects that I do want to point out. The main one being the insane characters of Outlast. We've already seen the Naked Twins and Dr. Traeger, so I don't really need to talk about too much here. But there is one guy I do want to highlight. The Groom, as he's called. His name is actually Eddie Gluskin. First of all, we see Eddie in the beginning of the DLC before they put him through the Morphtronic engine, and this is such a wake-up call to how damaging and brutal these experiments really are. He seems like a somewhat normal guy in this cutscene, just trying to save his own skin, but later when we encounter him, he's this complete psychopath. What makes him a psychopath, Josh? I mean, maybe he's misunderstood. <laughs> Well, remember, he's called the Groom, so where's the Bride? Notice how there are no women in sight for this game. And the saw on the table. And all the hanging bodies of mutilated men's corpses, I think you get the picture. This is personally what makes Outlast one of the best horror games, because these characters are leagues ahead in terms of disturbing when compared to any other game. Outlast is the most disturbing game I've played 
by a long shot, and it's due to these characters. The groom being the most unnerving if you ask me. Second place goes to this guy who tries to lick you, but at least he's trying to help, I guess. I think it's because Eddie is very deliberate. He's not just some animal like Chris Walker, he still has this semblance of human intelligence. Except he uses that to mutilate male corpses and make himself a bride. It's disgusting and one of the main reasons why the DLC is so good, from a horror perspective at least. I think I've covered most of what I wanted to talk about, and I just want to end with this. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Anyways, <laughs> thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate it. Let me know some of your favorite horror games. If Outlast is yours too, why not drop a like or something? I don't know. Uh, but anyways, I would love to hear about that. I do have a Patreon if you so wish to further support. And Bayonetta 3 will be the next video before God of War Ragnarok. And of course, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like and to subscribe for more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everyone. And of course, stay safe.